Can you imagine if someone you loved had been viciously attacked and left for dead? Against all odds, they're found and transferred to a hospital where they receive round-the-clock care for their horrific injuries. Despite the ordeal, they're safe now, aren't they? Hello, I'm Zoe and welcome back to my channel. Today, I'm talking about the case of Jill Russell Cahill. This story is unbelievably tragic. It deals with themes of domestic violence and I should say it's a solved case. And without jumping too far ahead of myself, I can say it's a landmark case, at least in American law. I hope you're sitting comfortably. Let's begin. It's 1986. In downtown Syracuse, New York, 29-year-old air hostess Jill Russell is out at a bar with her friends. At the bar, through mutual friends, she meets 26-year-old James Francis Cahill III, known to his friends as Jeff, and they hit it off immediately. He was smart, handsome, and he worked as a stockbroker at Merrill Lynch. They started dating, but it didn't take long for Jill to realise that Jeff's mother was a religious zealot. Patty Cahill was adamant, indeed overbearingly so, about the family's Catholic practices, insisting her children, even as grown adults, attend Mass daily. A few months into the relationship, Jill discovered she was pregnant and the couple made plans to marry. Despite his mother's protestations that she would never condone this union, they loved each other and that was all that mattered. Jeff ended up quitting his job at Merrill Lynch and starting his own construction business. The couple married and moved into a house in Skinny Atlas, a town southwest of Syracuse. By 1988, baby Timothy had arrived and Jill's life suddenly took on a whole new meaning. Less than two years later, they also had a baby daughter, Mary. After his daughter's birth, Jeff lost interest in his failing construction business and just stopped going to work. Concerned about finances, and although she had the burden of the couple's childcare to manage, Jill started a garden renovation business with two friends. She had been a hobby gardener and landscaper for many years, and had happily remodelled the couple's own garden since she'd been at home with the children. Word of mouth spread and soon her fledgling business was in great demand. She even had to turn down work for lack of time. However, the more successful Jill became, the more Jeff seemed to resent her. He hid the household bills from her and refused to pay them, resulting in the utilities being turned off on several occasions. In 1996, Jeff was arrested for writing bad checks, which put an even greater strain on tensions already growing within the marriage. Before she realised it, physical violence had entered, and Jill often found herself afraid of the partner she believed she would grow old with. She was exhausted both physically from being the breadwinner and emotionally from dealing with Jeff's games not to mention the issues with his very controlling family. By the autumn, she'd just about reached her breaking point. On Halloween that year, the couple attended a party. Jeff had come up with what he believed to be a clever Halloween costume. He dressed up as O.J. Simpson, and he wanted Jill 
to dress up as Nicole Brown Simpson. Jill flat out refused. In the summer of 1997, Jill had met another man who lived out of state and they'd started a long distance romance. She spent months deliberating, but finally decided that the best course of action would be to take the children and leave Jeff. It would take careful planning though, and even though close friends encouraged her, she wanted to time it so as to cause the least amount of distress for her children. A short time later, Jill discovered that Jeff had hidden a recording device in their home. She confronted him and they got into an argument. Jeff pulled her down onto the floor and twisted her arm behind her back. Jill was able to free herself and grab a knife before fleeing the house. She demanded a separation. Jeff agreed reluctantly and they signed a settlement of separation. The difficulty arose that as the family was so deeply in debt, neither of them could afford to move out of the property. One night in April 1998, a phone call came into the police department at 5.30 a.m. A police officer was dispatched to the Cahill house and when he arrived, he found five people waiting at the front of the residence, Jeff Cahill, his parents, his brother, and a doctor who was a family friend. The officer walked into the house and found Jill lying on the floor of the kitchen. The scene was horrific. There was blood everywhere. Jill was barely clinging to life. The officer recalled later being unable to describe the colour of her hair when asked, due to the fact that there was just so much blood matted to her head. He immediately called the paramedics. It was clear she'd suffered a vicious assault. There was a substantial wound visible on her left temple, and near her body lay a blood-covered baseball bat. The couple's children, Timothy and Mary, were upstairs in their bedrooms, unharmed, but terrified. Jeff appeared to have what was described as several superficial cuts on his hands and arms and was treated at a different hospital than the one Jill was taken to. In addition to Jill's substantial head injury, she had broken cheekbones, her arm was broken, and she had multiple skull fractures. The doctors placed her in an induced coma and had to operate, removing part of her brain and skull. At the police station, Jeff explained that he and Jill had argued, but he claimed that she'd picked up a knife and attacked him first. He said he'd used the bat to defend himself, but the evidence didn't appear to back up his claims. Their children also confirmed that they'd heard something different. Jill had been unarmed and moving away from Jeff towards the back patio area of the house when he struck her from behind. He hit her again before dragging her back towards the kitchen. As she lay helpless to defend herself, he stood over her and struck her several more times with the baseball bat. The children came running, woken by the noise, and Jill screamed at them to get help because he was going to kill her. But Jeff ordered them to go back upstairs to their room. After the brutal attack, Jeff decided to take his own life. He grabbed a length of hose from the garden and took it to his car in the garage. He inserted one end into the exhaust pipe and the other through a crack in the window. However, as he climbed in and turned on the ignition, his gaze focused on a rosary hanging from the mirror, and he changed his mind. He got out of the car, but he didn't call emergency services. Instead, he called his mother. A short time later, Jeff's parents, his brother, and the physician who was a family friend, arrived at the house. 
By this time, Jill had been lying in a battered state, drifting in and out of consciousness for hours. The doctor took one look at the scene and demanded that they call 911 immediately. Jeff was arrested and charged, but the day after he savagely beat the mother of his children within an inch of her life, he was released on bail. His family had posted the $100,000 required. During her recovery, Jill underwent 15 surgeries, survived life-threatening infections and beat meningitis. Recovery was slow and at times excruciatingly painful, but she was determined to fight. With her parents, her children, her sister and brother-in-law by her side, she was slowly returning to the living world. After six months, she could speak in short sentences, move her limbs a little, and even wash her own face. Her family was planning for her to move to a rehabilitation centre. On the evening of October the 27th, 1998, that all changed. Nurses on Jill's hospital wing noticed what they would later describe as a strange man loitering in the corridors. He was conspicuous because he was carrying a mop, but dressed very differently from the other janitorial staff. He seemed to be wearing painter's overalls instead of the regulation trousers and heavy workman's boots. Some accounts said he wore glasses and his hair was dishevelled or looked almost like a wig. Their suspicions aroused, the nurses checked on Jill. They immediately saw that her face was blue and her breathing very laboured. There was a white residue on her chin and an odd smell lingered in the air. Despite their efforts to save her, Jill fell back into a coma and by the morning she had died. Tests confirmed that she'd been poisoned with cyanide. Police arrested Jeff for questioning and it soon became clear that he had been planning this attack for months. His computer was seized and investigators discovered that in the weeks prior to the poisoning he had researched cyanide and its effects. He had submitted a fake purchase order with a forged letterhead from an electroplating company in the area to obtain the cyanide. Unbelievably, he waited outside the company offices and was able to intercept the delivery driver and sign for the package, taking possession of the deadly substance. Later, it was confirmed that the delivery driver had had the presence of mind to obtain Jeff's car license plate as a precaution, and this was used to incriminate him. Over the following weeks, he did several test runs at the hospital, trying his disguise, seeing how close he could get to Jill's room and watching the staff's daily routine. He then committed to the act, crept into Jill's room at 10 p.m. on October the 27th and forced the cyanide into her mouth. In 1997, Jeff Cahill was convicted of first-degree murder and received the death sentence. But in 2003, the New York Supreme Court overturned this death sentence. The New York Penal Code states that for a murder to be considered first degree, it must be committed in the commission of a second crime. Examples could include a thief killing someone during a robbery or a rapist killing his victim. Since the prosecution couldn't prove a second claim in conjunction with the poisoning, the death sentence was quashed. Cahill will be eligible for parole in 2036, when he's 75 years old. Jill's sister, Deborah, was outraged that Jeff had been allowed free on bail following the initial brutal attack. And after Jill's murder, she campaigned tirelessly to change the law. At that time, the only criteria 
for which a defendant was released on bail was whether they were deemed to be at risk of fleeing. Finally, in 2012, the New York State Senate passed what has become known as Gilly's Law, which gives courts the ability to consider more factors, including, crucially, victims' safety and the impact of a crime on victims or witnesses when setting a defendant's bail conditions. This has been such an important outcome for grieving families like Jill's, who have been vocal for so long about the injustices of a judicial system that set a man who wanted his wife dead free. Hopefully, they can take some small comfort from the fact that, as a direct result of their campaigning, the possibility of this happening to someone else has been greatly reduced. And that's the conclusion of today's case. Thank you so much for watching. If you found this story interesting and you haven't yet, please consider subscribing to my channel. I plan to release at least one video a week and I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments. Thanks again for your support and I'll look forward to seeing you again in the next one. Bye.